Good morning, everyone. My name is Randall Nadeau. I am the executive director of the Foundation for Scholarly Exchange, Fulbright Taiwan. The pandemic has disrupted and changed our lives in many ways, uh, some countries more than others. Currently, we have more than 200 American Fulbright grantees here in Taiwan, which is a remarkable achievement. Now the bad news. We have fewer than 10 Taiwan grantees in the United States. Hopefully things will change for the better and we can send our Taiwan grantees to the US for the in-person experience that is at the core of the Fulbright program without that kind of in-person, interpersonal communication and friendship building, colleague building, uh, the Fulbright program wouldn't be what it, what it has always been. At the same time, we have to think of creative ways in this new age uh, to, to rethink uh, the workplace, education, and the arts. So we've invited today three Fulbrighters to share with, with us their thoughts about the arts uh, in a post-COVID era. I think it will be a very interesting and stimulating conversation. Uh, our panelists today include, uh, the first speaker will be Craig Quintero from Grinnell College. He was a Fulbrighter to Taiwan 2015-16 uh, based at the Graduate Institute of Transdisciplinary Arts. What, what is that? Of of Beida. Oh, Beida. Okay, great. And he, uh, Craig, is the founder and artistic director of Riverbed, an experimental theater company in Taipei founded in 1998. Our second speaker will be Professor Mei-Chin Wang from Cal State Northridge. She is based as a current Fulbrighter at the College of Arts at National University of Tainan. She is working on a project on socially engaged public art, or art-led social activism. Uh, Professor Wang is one of what we call our China transfers. She was originally destined to do her Fulbright uh, work in China, but uh, after the previous president of the United States terminated the China program, we uh, welcomed uh, uh, those scholars who would like to try to do some variation on their research here in Taiwan. And Professor Wang has a very interesting project. Hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about it in a moment. Um, finally, uh, third speaker is Katie Baldwin from the University of Alabama at Huntsville. She is based this year at National Taiwan Normal University. And she is a woodblock wood print artist and she's doing a project that she has titled Modified Land, a series of woodblock prints. Uh, in addition, uh, we have our moderator for today's session, uh, Professor Huang Xinjian. Uh, Professor Huang is from National Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Normal University Department of Design and also a Fulbright scholar. He was a Fulbright Scholar 2019-2020 to the Pratt Institute. And I would also like to introduce a special guest, uh, Professor uh, Zhao Huiling. Professor Zhao Huiling is the Dean of the College of Arts <laughs> at uh, National Taiwan Normal University and uh, both uh, Professor Huang's Dean and the host for Katie Baldwin's project. 
Uh, Professor Zhao, would you say a few words of welcome? Thank you. Um, please forgive me for taking my note with me. And uh, I think uh, I was told that I should only prepare for one minute speech. However, uh, probably I will try to uh, limit it in two minutes. Okay. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the Dean of the College of Arts from National Taiwan Normal University, uh, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Fulbright Taiwan. Um, having invited Professor Katie Baldwin to my university and uh, recommending one of our dis uh, distinguished Professor Xin Jian Huang to Pratt uh, Institute as a visiting scholar in 2019. And I think he um, came, came back just before they closed the city of New York. Is that right? And uh, uh, his wife, Cao Xiaoyue, would you mind say hi? Well, I think that's very interesting story. Maybe uh, they could share with you later. Okay. And uh, I think the Fulbright Scholarship has once again given tremendous support to the international academic exchange in the field of art. And this provides an incredible opportunity for our students to advance in both their practical art skills and global mobility. The topic of today's conference, making the interaction of arts more viable in the post-pandemic world. I think this is a very important topic for people in the world right now. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought huge changes to how we interact with one another, both at the personal level and at the international level. Therefore, I think it is crucial that we not only continue to find ways to adjust to these changes, but also we have to strive harder to accomplish the goals we had set out for our, for our students and us to achieve. With that being said, I am extremely looking forward to the outcome of today's conference because I believe, I think our efforts will in many ways further empower the development in the field of art and education, and not only in Taiwan, but in the US. So thank you very much, and I wish you all uh, a wonderful and fruitful seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Zhao. Uh, before I introduce Professor Huang, I would just like to extend my thanks to the uh, staff who put this program together. Dahlia, where are you? Oh, Dahlia Zhang. Please thank Dahlia for her hard work to, to put this together and the other staff and interns from Fulbright uh, who make this event possible. So thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, our moderator for today's session is Professor Huang Xinjian and uh, Professor Huang, would you introduce our speakers? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks for Professor Randall. Uh, this is my uh, great pleasure and honor to introduce you uh, three very distinguished uh, uh, scholars of Fulbright. Uh, so the first one is uh, Quint Quintero. Um, Quintero, I think uh, Randolph already mentioned, he is the uh, director of the River Riverbed Theater Company. And Craig has uh, written direct over 15 original image-based performance, including production at Korea's Arts Culture Center, uh, Taiwan's National Exper Experimental Theater, Theater of, uh, in Paris, and uh, many, many theater like in Singapore, in uh, Vancouver, and Tokyo, and especially also in Robert Wilson's uh, Watermill Center in New York. And he's very uh, multifaceted. He's also a sculptor and an installation artist. Uh, his work has been shown in the Asian Biennial, Venice Biennale, uh, Kobe Biennale, Taipei Biennale, and the Taipei Fine Art Museum. So, um, and today his talk will be Acting is Reacting, 
Taiwan theater community's response to the pandemic. So in his talk, he will address the manner in which the government, uh, theater, and artists in Taiwan uh, had developed in innovation response to the pandemic. The next one will be Professor uh, Wang Meiqing. Um, Dr. Wang uh, specializes in modern and uh, contemporary Chinese art and uh, teach Asian art history, of course. Had her dissertation and published uh, material focused on the recent development of the contemporary art from China and their social, political, economy, and the in institutional <laughs> implication in the context of uh, commercialization urbanization and the globalization of the Chinese world. Uh, and today her talk will be Art that Make Life Viable, Ecology, Community, and uh, Artivism in Chongqing. So this talk uh, will discuss the search of the ecological art-led community activism in Chongqing, China, in the wake of COVID-19. And the, the third uh, speech uh, speakers will be Katie Baldwin. And Katie uh, received her Bachelor of Art from the Evergreen State College and the Master of Fine Art in the University of the Art in 2004. And she is a Fulbright Scholar in 2020 to 2021. She will conduct her project, Modify Lan Landscape, at the International Print Center in Taipei, Taiwan. And her talk today will be collaborative artistic book, Shift Lab Collect Collective. And she will comparatively discuss of two of her collaborative artist book, REF, which is already complete in 2019, and the multiple discovery, which will be dis uh, complete in 2022. So uh, let's welcome Craig uh, for her talk. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here and to share some of my research uh, with all of you. Uh, so the topic of my talk today is Acting is Reacting, Taiwan Theater Community's Response to the Pandemic. And so if you're unfamiliar with the term Acting is Reacting, it's really sort of a, a really uh, basic theoretical process that on stage that you're not just doing what you've always been doing, but you're always present, you're always reacting, you're always responding, you're in the moment. And I think that during the pandemic, it's really been this time where we're all responding to the unknown, being very nimble in how we sort of react to that. And so in presenting or preparing for this presentation, uh, I'm starting on January 22nd, uh, 2020, when the Taiwanese government for the first time uh, posted online um, a message warning Taiwan about COVID. And if you have a temperature or a cough, if you're having trouble breathing, wash your hands and wear a mask. This is January 22nd. Um, and so again, I don't want to get derailed here by talking about Taiwan and WHO, but I'm just thinking about um, this was already being uh, circulating. These were policies that were being adopted by other countries and disseminated and thinking about how we can sort of um, strengthen those relationships. So in the United States, we're not waiting until April or May or June, but we're sort of proactively reacting. Uh, along those lines, um, and I'm sort of going to talk about the broader context and then focus um, on some specific artists and how they responded to the times. Uh, so, so I know there's a lot of new Fulbrighters. So on February 6th, uh, the Taiwanese government started a mandate which was controlling how you could purchase masks. So you'd have to use your national ID card to be able to access that. So it wasn't that you could buy them at any store you had to use this, and so they're limiting them, so it would be able to be disseminated equally and throughout the country. Um, and then in responding to that, as we start shifting gears and focusing on the art community, this is a image from the Taiwan National Theater, where on February 26th, they were already producing masks for other members of the, um, who were unable to purchase them. And so these were people that were working in the costume shop or in the scene shops. And so they had talents, and as shows were being canceled, well, what do you do? And so instead of just bemoaning the situation, proactively already starting to make masks and distribute them among coworkers and then amongst the community. So again, this is February 26th that this is happening. 
Um, also, in terms of thinking about the government response, on February 27th, the Ministry of Culture um, posted a response that uh, stated, in response to the projected impact of COVID-19, the Ministry of Culture, Administrative and Regulative Plans, and revised in measures for the cultural and art sector. I guess it shifted to uh, PowerPoint, so it's cutting it off a little bit there. But I really like this, that this is on February 27th, and the projected impact. So this was before uh, a lot of shows were being canceled. This was before international travel was shut down. But with the projected impact, the government in Taiwan was already proactively thinking about, well, what can we do, right? Not waiting for five or six months after for a relief package, but as it's happening in real time, reacting. Uh, this person might look like a pretty harmless, uh, sweet guy. In reality, uh, this is Brett Dean. So he's an Australian, and so he traveled to Taiwan from London and Thailand, and he was performing at the National Concert Hall, and even though people recommended and requested that he wear a mask, uh, he refused to do so. And so he had a cough, and when he went back to Australia on March 5th, they discovered, or he went back on the 2nd, he got tested on the 5th, and they discovered he had COVID, which led to the shutdown of the National Theater and basically uh, their programming for the next four months. He expressed regret. Um, so, <laughs> um, but thinking about, and, and again, obviously, but, but how do we respond? How do we react and sort of follow policies or not? And then the impact that it has. Um, and so thinking about the impact that it has, um, this is at the uh, National Theater. They started to have, um, Know, sort of different protocols, and so these are for folks who are just arriving here, so when, if you ever go to the theater, you need to wear a mask, they'll take your temperature, it's the same as here, the disinfectant. Um, at the time, it was also dealing with how you could space yourself in relationship to other people, so physically distancing inside the theater. Sorry, did I skip a slide? Yeah. And so um, that, then that immediate process then of how uh, the theaters responded. So on March 6th, all of the programming that the National Theater did stopped. Um, and so at the time, they were part of the Taipei International Festival of the Arts, where they'd invited a number of con international companies to come, and suddenly um, everything uh, changed. And disinfecting, um, initially they were going to disinfect once every day, and then it became once every hour as people were still circulating in the buildings. Um, and then all of the shows, sort of one after another, became canceled, canceled, canceled. And some of these were because people from abroad didn't want to fly to Taiwan because they were concerned about safety. Little did they know. Um, and others were that the National Theater also became concerned and the government um, had strict limitations about people being able to fly into the country. And so the Ministry of Culture also was proactively saying, we need to cut down on this and unless they apply for a specific work permit, they'll be unable to enter the country. Um, then the Ministry of Culture also developed then a second uh, policy on March 12th, the relief revitalization measure to mitigate COVID-19 impact. And so they had two different categories. And again, I apologize, we shifted to PowerPoint, so it's cutting off a little bit. Um, and so the first one was to deal with sort of more on larger institutional or sort of company level. And so you could apply for funding. And the second was um, to sort of, if your performances were canceled or your projects were canceled, you could apply for the government for relief. And the second one was not just sort of replying, so if something is canceled, funding you because you lost your job, but also thinking about what sort of programming the government could organize to sort of proactively say, okay, well, we can't do these type of work, what else can we do? And so that second category was really subsidizing new alternative projects that weren't happening beforehand. So one is to say, if you've lost your job, we can provide money to help subsidize you. The second was, well, in this time, if we can't do these type of traditional arts or exhibitions or performances, what can we do? And so again, they had two different uh, levels of funding. So the first, if you were a larger organization, you could apply up for uh, uh, new time and dollars, 2.5 million, and for an individual up to 60,000 NT dollars, um, which isn't a huge amount of money, but again, we're sort of like comparatively looking at what was happening in the arts in the states and thinking about at this early stage on March 12th that the government was already thinking about, well, how do we help artists who are suddenly unemployed? And their trips were canceled and their performances and exhibitions were canceled. 
Um, and so looking then at um, the Taiwan National Theater, and so I've sort of used that as um, one of the main institutions because it's government funded and it's sort of like the premier arts institution in Taiwan. And so it really became a model for a lot of other companies um, and uh, theaters across the country. Um, so they stopped staging their own work from March 6th. So the day after um, everything sort of shut down, thanks to Brett Dean, the harmless looking guy. Um, and then they shut down until um, the beginning of June. Um, and in response to that, so they stopped all of their own programming. That didn't mean that they completely shut down. They started enabling other theaters if you wanted to rent the space and you're able to meet the strict demands of social, physically distancing, all of the other different demands. And so they're still enabling people to do work there, but it would be suddenly, if you were a theater company doing that, you could only sell 30% of your tickets. And so suddenly, I mean, like, in the reality is most theater companies would be sort of not economically viable to do that, right? And so basically from March 6th until the beginning of June, the National Theater pretty much shut down in terms of um, other companies doing actual fully staged work. They also developed two really important policies. One was the research and development, Yan Jiu Fa Zhan Fang An. And so this was for um, their funding theater companies who were initially going to be staging work there, and suddenly they were unable to. And so they're giving them money to continue working on that production. And so uh, after the pandemic ended, they'd be able to mount their work. And so again, sort of helping companies that initially were going to do the show continue to develop it and then later remount it. And the other was uh, this uh, called Shiyan, so doing a tryout. And this was an opportunity for some companies who normally wouldn't be able to perform at the National Theater to, to work on the main stage. And so, um, and, this, uh, and so they've funded about five or six different companies, provided this opportunity for them to do a tryout. And I was one of the beneficiaries of that. Um, so initially, I was at um, Duke University as a uh, Mellon's Humanities Unbounded Fellow as COVID was hitting. And we're working on a production that people from the National Theater were going to fly and see and then maybe produce at the National Theater here. Um, and then, you know, so rehearsing there, suddenly it got canceled. And then the National Theater said in the end of July, in the beginning of August, they would give us an opportunity to use the main stage and develop the work. And so here's a picture of me with my head looking on the side. We're having some technical issues with the, the screen there. And so dealing, obviously, as you're all dealing with uh, long distance collaborations, I got a crook in my neck for about 20 minutes of that. We finally figured it out. Oh my God. Um, and, but just again, so, you know, how do we respond? So I was in the United States. They were rehearsing in Taiwan. I'd be waking up at two in the morning to be able to attend rehearsals. Probably a lot of you were doing similar things with classes or talking to family. Um, but, you know, you react, you respond. And so, and again, obviously it's blurry. I could sort of see in general um, what the actors were doing. Um, but, you know, gradually I was able to fly to Taiwan um, in the beginning of July. And then we staged our first uh, tryout of this uh, production called The Forgotten, which is dealing with coal mining uh, in Taiwan and in the United States. And so it was the first time we, uh, for our theater company to perform in a 1,500-seat theater. If the Taiwanese National Theater would not have provided this tryout opportunity, we would have sort of immediately jumped from a small theater to a large theater, which would be next to impossible. And so for them giving us the space was free, no one was using it, and so providing it to the companies. And so it's not having dead space or unused space, it's how do we help support artists? And so um, a brief advertisement, if you're still here on November 6th and 7th, you can come see the show. If you buy tickets from me, you'll get a 10% discount. Okay, no, okay. all right. Um, and so now talking about how other artists responded. And so this was a production that was initially gonna be staged at the National Taichung Theater in, um, in April. And um, so uh, as the pandemic was hitting, it was initially gonna be a live performance and so how did they respond? And so this is a really interesting performance. It was a, a, a production uh, by Wang Liancheng. Actually, I'm not sure the tones on that. And then uh, Qian Xiaozi, a good choreographer. And she was working with a, one dancer and a robot. And so here's the robot that she was gonna be performing with and seeing her interact with that. And so they were in rehearsal. They, they were doing their tryout at that space. And then suddenly they said, well, we can't, we can't have the audience here. So what do we do? And at that point, they suddenly shifted to having sort of like the uh, national uh, theater uh, in, in, in London, how they staged the live broadcast, the National Theater Live. So they started to use that model. And so they hired a team of uh, people that would be doing live streaming of the show. And so it went from sort of a normal theatrical production. And so here you can see the people with their computers all set up in front. Um, they hired uh, four different uh, 
uh, cinematographers or filmmakers who would be filming. They had to hire a new lighting designer. They had to hire a new sound designer. Suddenly, their design went from a theater show to basically being a film. And so in terms of the relationship then between the director who was initially going to stage a, th a stage show, suddenly they're collaborating with a whole new artistic team and trying to think, okay, we're shifting mediums. What does that entail? And so here are some images from the production. So it's really a beautiful show of uh, you know, the human body and um, this, this robot, sort of thinking about technology and the humans. And then sort of this, suddenly this uh, inclusion of this whole different set of people and thinking about how that collaboration could work. Um, and also then for the theater, because suddenly they weren't selling tickets. This was a free online broadcast. And so the theater company, or the theater, the National Taijong Theater, uh, was willing to say, okay, we're gonna eat this, we're gonna lose money, but we're still gonna support this project. And so it was nationally streamed around the world. Uh, the National Theater here in Taiwan also did this other project, uh, not only in the theater. And so here they're saying again, um, at this time this was starting off in about, um, probably about May of 2020. And so they wanted to think about, well, how do we respond as an organization? If we can't do theater shows, what can we do? And so they did like an open call where people could submit projects about what is theater or performance or interdisciplinary or intermediate art, what can we do? And so they received over probably about 60 or 70 applications. And if you applied and you were one of the top 30 and it was by public voting. And so the idea was like really to sort of cast a wide net, not just the people that they knew, but to encourage other people in the community. Like, okay, given these times, how would you respond? And so again, 60 to 70 people applied. Um, and then if you were one of the top 30, they would give you 10,000 NT, which isn't much. Um, but again, it, it's sort of honoring um, your, your, your work. And so they had three winners. Uh, one did more of a, a film-based work. Another did a piece where there was like a, a live performance. And I'm just gonna race through these because it's really hard. Um, the National Theater maybe wasn't too happy with the success of these, but anyway, it was an experiment. And then this person did sort of like a flash mob where people were bringing their um, technology um, and sort of working at the National Theater and doing a flash mob there. Um, they also hired um, the choreographer Chen Wu Kang to do um, uh, another piece. And so he's a, an amazing uh, choreographer with the company Biao. And so he did this uh, piece called Xie Xie Nin Liu Zai Jia Li Ma, or some, something along those lines. And so the thing's like, thank you for staying home. So don't come to the theater, stay there. And so what they did was they had um, seven different cameras doing different feeds. The audience would sign up for a ticket and then you could go online and then you could choose between these seven different uh, scenes that were occurring. So in a, in a way, it was sort of like you're making your, choosing your own adventure, because you'd see this performance and then you could cut to this. And so they had, one of them was sort of like a chat room discussion. One was on stage, uh, inside a space by a temple, in the temple. Um, they had also the backstage work, so you could watch sort of demystifying the creative process. You could watch the people running the show as the show was being run. Uh, they were playing with somebody working with green screens. And so this is kind of a really cool image. So someone wanted to see all the different angles at the same time. So they um, downloaded it five times. And so they could watch five different scenes at the same moment. And so they didn't have to cut between. Uh, it only cost NT $1. And it was basically just to have you pay so you would be able to go in and explore that space. Another project was Facing the City by Zhou Dongyan. And it was a collaboration between a company in the Netherlands and Taiwan. And so in this work, um, in the Netherlands, they were still physically socially distancing. And then in Taiwan, they were able to do the production in, in the in National Experimental Theater. And so here, you can see in the middle of the show, they were um, sort of chatting with each other, Skyping. So you can see the actor here. And then in the back, there's an actor in the Netherlands. And this interaction there were sort of two performances happening in two different companies. But suddenly, they were combining, and they were together. And so this project initially, Zhou Dongyan was going to travel to the Netherlands to work with them. And suddenly, instead, they were uh, collaborating via Skype. And so two different shows happening in two different countries. And suddenly, they were able to um, sort of be combined and still do the show in a radically different format than what they initially imagined, but still to, 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 to work with the piece. A sort of a less successful model of thinking about how we respond, the Manila Zoo for the Taipei Arts Festival decided to do like a Zoom call, so Zoom streaming. So they had the live performance of these artists in Manila, um, and then they were sort of broadcasting. The audience went and watched the show in the theater. And obviously with Zoom calls, we all know probably how that turned out. And so a lot of glitches and delays. And so thinking about like, well, okay, that model doesn't work. So, so what do we do now? Um, and so I'm gonna flash forward until 2021. 
And so recently, and currently, the uh, National Theater, and so if you haven't bought tickets or if you don't know, the National Theater is doing their Taipei International Festival of the Arts. So recently they did a production by Dmitry Papoano um, from March 2nd to 7th. And so they were screening a project that he did called Inside, which he staged initially in 2011. They were uh, projecting the, screen, the, the production on a large screen, and so you're just watching a film of it. Um, but they also sort of created this more uh, sort of installation-like environment where the audience was able sit on couches or on bean bags or on beds and so the whole production is about being in an apartment and they tried to model that so even you're just watching the show that's pre-recorded they wanted to alter the manner in which you're experiencing it so and change your embodied experience they also staged uh, Medea by the International Theater Amsterdam and so this they actually did a live performance on the production uh, in Amsterdam and uh, so no audience there but they were live streaming it and so again, thinking about so, and then the next day they uh, performed as part of the festival in Adelaide in Australia. And so again, so the, in, in, in Amsterdam, they couldn't perform for a live audience at this time. So they were performing it live for audience in Taiwan and Australia, whereas the people in Amsterdam couldn't see it live, right? And so again, how do you, how do you be nimble? How do you respond? Another production they staged was Sopro by Diego Rodriguez. And with this production, um, it was taking a pre-existing work that was pre-recorded and just showing it. And so again, it was sort of uh, maybe 300 people attended. So it's a really amazing director. But just by screening the work without changing the experience, why go see it at the theater? Why spend 300 NT instead of watching it at home? And so it really changes the dynamic of how we're seeing work and how we're experiencing this. The last thing I want to mention is uh, Taiwan is currently working on a 5G programming um, pro uh, project where they're going to try to set up in the National Theater, um, they're buying six high-resolution cameras, they're going to have four for the Experimental Theater, so hopefully next year they'll also be able to start with the National Theater Live, which has been going on in London since 2009, that Taiwan's work will be able to be streamed abroad. So in Taiwan they're able, still able to create work and still have live theater and be able to broadcast it around the world and share it with communities that maybe are unable to do that. And so again, I, I think that that whole phrase of acting is reacting, how we respond, and how we sort of continue creating in the time of a pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So uh, thank you, Craig, for his uh, re insight uh, speech. I think that's uh, really important for this uh, pandemic era and. Uh, I think it sheds some light for what we ha can do next. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Wang Meiqing. Uh, her speech will be, uh, the topic of her speech is the uh, art lab make life viable, ecology, community, and uh, act artivism in Chongqing. Good morning, everyone. This is Meiqing Wang. And first, I would like to thank FSE for organizing this seminar, which gives me an opportunity to present a research that I'm actually starting. So I'm like the beginning stage. That's eco art, ecological art or eco art that I have developed an interest since last year. I'm still in the process of learning. So I'm going to start with my introduction. OK, so as uh, been mentioned a, a couple of times, uh, I think uh, 2020 is going to be the year that's going to be remembered in the future, maybe as a great turning point uh, for human history, uh, because uh, uh, the onslaught of the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, has changed the human society in profound ways yet to be fully manifested. Uh, while already claimed, uh, like, I think, more than 2.5 uh, million lives, and then mm, I think, uh, of course, uh, shut down international, in, international travel, uh, let millions of, of people not able to provide for their families, right? Uh, and also introduce mistrust and uh, hatred among different races and the different nations, right? But not all is bad, right? One thing that actually stands out to be particularly promising is that uh, global-wide, there is an inc increasing recognition of the uh, severity of uh, environmental degradation that the whole human uh, society uh, deals with. And that's been actually identified by many as the ultimate culprit of the global uh, health crisis. And it just becomes apparent when uh, most of us are locked down or locked down indoors, the environment just got better miraculously. Right? It says a lot right, about what we have done to our environment. 
So really global wide, it is like a, a disparate effort from different people right, uh, who try to do whatever they could to mitigate the damage that's been done uh, on our ecology and to at least try to kind of mitigate our bro uh, yeah, to try to recover our broken ecosystem. And it's with this uh, background or this context in mind that actually I would like to introduce the, or talk a little bit about the, the ecological or eco art led community activism or eco activism in Chongqing, a major municipality in southwest uh, China in 2020, starting with its first uh, community eco garden. So in November 2020, uh, actually December, okay, December 2020, um, a small rundown of the community known as Yudian Zilu neighborhood in Chongqing, uh, in Huanjiaoping district in Chongqing, welcomed the visitors from across the city and the uh, nation um, with its uh, first community eco garden entitled Spring of Huan Jueping. It's actually the name of an exhibition, but it's not an exhibition, it's a kind of social practice. Here, people actually, uh, visitors, were welcomed with uh, a series of artistic and uh, creative intervention of the not less than desirable living environment in this old community, starting with the entrance, which is a long staircase leading to the local kindergarten. Here, we see uh, the old rundown staircase and where the wall now will address the with uh, dressed up with animistic uh let's say cartoonish animals plants and uh, flowers and on the walls you see the drawings and paintings of children so this like becomes a gallery open door gallery and after uh, visitors uh, climb this cheerful staircase. They actually would encounter a climbing garden on top. So we're going this way, climbing garden, and then herb garden, sky garden, edible garden. Mm, what's it called? Uh, plant. Eventually, they reach the ecological pool where they get to learn how to recycle rain and no sewage water. So with these serious small gardens that actually transform a very ordinary, even by now, uh, pathway into an interesting corridor greeneries where visitors get to appreciate uh, the mutual beneficial interrelations or interactions of urban landscape, uh, landscape planning and the organic growth. Right? Uh, varied in size, in shape, and in ground level. This actually uh, provides a very, uh, it basically opens up uh, many new public space for community gathering and for gardening. Title The Spring of Huan Jueping. The uh, designers, the artists, and the community members who are all involved in the creation of these community eco garden actually were thinking about not just uh, not just uh, bringing new growth and uh, uh, green like color to this old community just like a spring does no, nature does when spring comes they were also thinking about uh, uh, employing the force of art for urban renewal okay? so it's like the idea is uh, a combination of art and activism okay? so activism in making real changes small scale in the community at the grassroots level. So this is a product, so the garden, it's a product of uh, more than uh, about two months collaboration of uh, artists, curators, designers, landscape planners, volunteers, local residents, including children. More than two, about two months collaboration as they work together and they talk about how to you know, revive, how to reuse, how to recycle the space and make the space, the place more livable, aesthetically and ecologically. So here are some snapshots from the process. Okay. And really embracing the very difficult topography of this hilly mountainous area, right? It's, and this old rundown and it's dominated by the industrial style architecture, the 
the really by this time is so old, so run out. The young people did not want to live here, and only like old people remain most of uh, the case here. So they were really examining, doing research, and really understand, uh, try to figure out what's the best way to make this uh, uh, community uh, more livable. And at the same time, they're also trying to really, really stimulate the growth of ecologically oriented public culture okay, within the community. So here are a few shots where you see uh, the curators and artists who are doing research, figuring out their way. And you get to see before, right, the staircase were painted. And this, and this area, not only uh, the color is quite a, quite a uh, depressing, but also at the corners you'll see, before you'll see like piles of trash at the corners of corridors and the uh, corners of alleys. Okay, so it was really not a place that you would like to spend your time there. And then as a result of the two months of working together, they basically really uh, make this now a very interesting place. And especially, right? I mean, in other parts of China, Chinese cities, they were eco gardens. But as a community-oriented eco garden in Chongqing, it was the first. So it was really promoted and celebrated and really stimulated a lot of public interest within the city. Okay. And although initiated by curators and professional artists, this project really involved uh, a really thorough consultation with lo uh, local residents at the beginning stage and then during the production or the creation and then the continuous maintenance afterwards because these are the gardens that need to be maintained. Once the artists are gone, in many cases, once the artists are gone, things are done. But in this particular case, no, actually they want this uh, project to continue. That's why community engagement really was the key of the artist effort. Right? Their goal was really to uh, enable, stimulate, and facilitate community engagement and participation in the long run. Okay. And that's the split, the, the kind of split, the, uh, the split I'm trying to uh, introduce is uh, eco art community-based eco-artivism. The kind of split that really underpinned the 2020 Chongqing Ecological Art Festival for which the community eco-garden was part of it. Okay. Or oh, see if you can call that. So this is a city-wide collective endeavor uh, initiated uh, by a lot of uh, private and public institutions based in Chongqing and uh, uh, universities from other cities led by Chongqing, uh, by Sichuan Fine Arts Institute, so the leading art school in southwest China, and curated by three professors from the art school. And it actually was based on a small, much smaller scale art festival, uh, eco art festival in 2019, but they really expanded uh, in terms of the collaboration and in terms of the public outreach, in terms of their commitment to uh, community participation. So it actually was a, um, an unprecedented undertaking even in China based on, uh, to my knowledge, in terms of the commitment, this scale commitment to the public outreach and the community engagement. So uh, basically, this, although it actually this particular uh, um, festival incorporates exhibitions, workshops, um, public uh, educational programs, and uh, participatory programs, it actually was perceived to be a multi-dimensional platform to explore the potential of eco-art, not only as an art category, but also as a methodology for community engagement. Right? For the purpose of, uh, okay, okay, I'm going too fast. Okay. For the pur purpose of uh, stimulating a kind of agency, community agency among the general public okay, to transform basically uh, ordinary citizens from mere being the passive victims of environmental problems to the uh, actors and the participants of their own environment. So that's like the under, un, under really underlying message they were trying to promote with this citywide uh, um, eco art festival. Okay. And the kind of eco art activism, the kind of split embodied, uh, embraced by CIF actually uh, is 
really uh, benefited from two main factors, two main new development in China. The first being Chinese government's recent investment in community development and its promotion of micro reconstruction as a new direction in urban renewal. And this is a new direction that's been promoted in recent years, which is very different from earlier urban transformation in mainland China, which always involved a, a massive scale uh, demolition and reconstruction, like uh, wipe down everything and start from new. This is a new, more subtle, more culturally sensitive, more, let's say, ecologically uh, sensitive approach. And micro reconstruction aims to update the appearance and function of buildings through partial demolition, replacement of building functions, maintenance and repair, renovation, protection, activation, improvement of infrastructure, in order to maintain the current uh, construction pattern and texture. Okay. So importantly, this approach actually emphasized the importance of preserve the social, cultural fabric of the community and the built environment while trying to improve the overall living environment. And that's the first factor that this echo activism I talk, I'm talking about the benefit from. Another is the, the second one is the government's promotion of eco civilization as a national discourse. Eco civilization as a term began to be used by Chinese academics since 1980, so it's been always going on, but it's really uh, took off as a national discourse is with uh, Xi, Jinping at, Xi Jinping administration. Okay. So it became connected with his discourse of building a beautiful China, and both are identified by him as important components of his China dream uh, vision. Right? I'm sure you probably heard the China Dream. Right? Xi Jinping is the one who promotes China Dream, and he, in many public speeches, he insisted that uh, eco civilization is one of the major national goals under his governance. So, so as you know, the government has really promote promotes the idea and the discourse of eco-civilization, and a decisive step took place in 2018 when eco-civilization was incorporated into China's constitution. So we amid these two national discourses, uh, ecologically conscious Chinese art professionals really uh, took the opportunity and advanced their own grassroots uh, discourse. And that's the discourse that combine the critical reflection of China's environment, environmental problem and socially engaged art that uh, could be actually incorporated and carried out at the communities at the grassroots level. And then, right, this activism really got an unexpected boost in 2020 with the outbreak of COVID-19. So it looks like I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to go faster, <laughs> a little bit faster. So this is uh, CIF, right? The art festival has a core exhibition, six parallel exhibitions, three special action projects, and an international forum on ecological art and agriculture. And with all this, the idea is really to promote a paradigm shift okay, in terms of human development from human-centric to natural-centric. So that's like a, really an ambitious goal that they were advocating with this, uh, with this festival. And let me move on to uh, my last section, ecological art as community-based participatory public art. So the core exhibition is themed regeneration, and that the catch word that they promote is respect trash, reject extravagance. The idea came from the observation of three curators who observed that every year other grad, uh, grad students right, from their school throw away things when they graduate. And the um, campus managers and staff had to like a, uh, ship away piles of trash, trucks by trucks, and that's not just to college university students, but actually you see it's prevailing across China. So they hope the ecological art will become a concept that can encounter this mindless throwaway lifestyle that really characterizes modern society, especially in recent China under the kind of uh, consumerism and the surface, the prosperity. So there works the show, right? Artists explore the possibility of reuse, trash, or cri critical effect, you know, a, you know the, 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 the consumerist-driven and uh, throwaway lifestyle that has become you know, accustomed to most Chinese urbanites. And 
I try to emphasize participation of communities is really an important uh, factor that CIF tried to popularize ecological art in uh, China and for the purpose to foster public interest and capability in environmental protection to cultivate a sense of ecological responsibility in their daily life and ultimately foster civic participation through eco art making for a greener lifestyle and greener earth. And in a, in a way, right, this entire festival can be seen as a public pedagogical campaign for ecology and sustainability literacy, right? A, a kind of literacy that we all need right, in, in, in this world more and more. And a point I made uh, earlier, to transform ordinary citizens from passive victims of environmental problems into active participants who can work together to restore our broken ecosystem. So community participation is the key. So you have the core exhibition, then you have parallel exhibitions that really emphasize community engagement. And an important feature of CIV is it actually try to integrate public art and uh, eco art. Okay? And the eco garden I introduced is a, definitely a good example. And then there are two parallel exhibitions, the everyone public, even ecology, ecological and ecological new communities. Now, those t titles are self-evident. Right? And I'm going to quickly show what I have here. The, a few uh, images are taken during you know, the preparation for these exhibitions or social practices. And then here's another one, and here's uh, a public herb station that uh, actually work together. And move on to my last case. Right? So on the other side of uh, um, the city, you have an artist, a, a dedicated ecological artist, Ji Li Peng, who actually initiated a you know, project, the Healing Garden, a collaborative work uh, project that's developed out of a land field that was containing construction waste. So he actually took this as a lab for his teaching, public pedagogy, and the collaboration with his students and community members for, um, for, uh, for basically working together to transform this wasteland into a place where you can grow he uh, healthy, safe, and organic food, starting from research, right? But, uh, and then building a uh, gardening bed, the past waste, waste materials, on, uh, the waste material. And then he introduced edible garden, ed edible landscape, edible campus, and he involved uh, Mm, knowledge such as uh, composting, have, uh, water harvesting, animal and uh, natural, mm, I'll say natural habitat building for insects and bees. So it's really a cross disciplinary uh, undertaking in order to accomplish the purpose of healing. For him, healing is not just uh, uh, healing the the polluted land, right? But also uh, the uh, the kind of alienated culture, alienated lifestyle that more than individuals have been living. So for him, healing is like a multiple dimensional. So quickly, conclusion. Uh, Eco activism. So the idea is that it reestablish the value of frugality and respect to nature and food. You know, those are core values of Chinese culture by long being abandoned in the age of consumerism and the surface prosperity. And then introduce new values uh, respect for manual labor and the collective learning that are, um, really are, should be the core values of our. Uh, the uh, shared responsibility in the age of Anthropocene. Anthropocene. And then the idea is that right, art uh, is no longer a field above, but enters into the everyday experience and aids in the creation of more substantial, creative, and sustainable living environment for communities. And then I finally, in dealing with multiple crises of our time, pandemic, economic downturn, and climate change, three major crises of our time, I I argue that we need art that communicates rather than conceals, connects rather than isolates, collaborates rather than divides, and engages rather than ignores the existential threat of our time. So ecological art with community engagement at its goal is an art that seeks to make life more viable, not just human lives, but lives of all sentient beings that are sharing this planet Earth. And in making life viable, art becomes viable. Thank you, and sorry for taking a little bit longer. So uh, thank you for Professor Wang uh, for this uh, eco art project. Um, I think it's very beautiful and also it's also uh, very well to interpret uh, the artists taking the challenge of the pandemic and turn it into an opportunity of solving our uh, environmental problem. Uh, so our next uh, speakers, uh, Katie Bowen, uh, her topic will be collaborative 
artistic books, Shift Lab collect, uh, Collective. So uh, let's welcome Katie. Thank you. Hi. Um, I hope that you don't, I don't know how I'm going to do all of this with two hands, but my notes are on my computer, so I'm going to be sitting here. Um, my name is Katie Baldwin. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm an associate professor of book arts and printmaking in the BFA program at University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my experience making artist books through long distance collaborations and how this collaborative practice has influ been influenced by the pandemic. I earned my BA from the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington in 1994 and my MFA from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia in 2004. I work in a variety of printmaking processes that include screen print, etching, lithography, and woodblock. However, the focus of my research interests is Mokohanga and letterpress. Mokohanga is the traditional technique of printmaking that uses water-based pigment and handheld discs called a barren for, print for printing. You can see an example of one of my works here on your left. And letterpress is a technique that uses movable type composed on the bed of a printing press. You can see an example of my work in letterpress here on the right. While I maintain a studio practice in woodblock and letterpress printing, I'm also interested in expressing ideas through book arts. The historical tradition of book production are collaborative in nature. A book was not created by an individual, but through the combined effort of a group of artisans with a range of skills. In the spirit of this historical tradition, I, along with four other book artists, formed the collective Shift Lab. Today, I'm going to focus on two of our artist book projects, REF, which was published in 2018 and 19, and our current project, Multiple Discovery, which, was, um, which will be completed in 2000, or 2022. I also will explain some of the ways in which the artist book market has been adjusting to the pandemic. Tricia Tracy, Sarah Bryant, Macy Chadwick, Denise Bookwalter, and I have been producing work together as Shift Lab since 2013. Our individual interests and skills intersect in letterpress and book arts. However, we each bring distinct areas of expertise to the group. This image of the five of us was taken at the Codex Book Fair in California in 2015. It's one of the only two times that we've all been together in the same place. We began our collaborative practice from a distance, and the distance between us has become the frame for our collaborative work. Over the eight years we've been working together, we've adjusted to the typical hurdles of life. We've moved, started businesses, begun new jobs, gotten married, earned tenure, dealt with aging parents, grandparents, and in-laws, and have had children and grandchildren. This map shows our current locations as of 2020. Macy Chadwick is the director of In Cahoots Artist Residency in Petaluma, California. Tricia Tracy recently relocated to Hanover, New Hampshire, where she teaches at Dartmouth College. Sarah Bryant is an assistant professor in the MFA program at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Denise Bookwalter lives in Tallahassee, Florida, where she teaches printmaking and book arts for Florida State University. Our collaborative process has changed for each project as we've learned what works, what doesn't work, and how we'd like to increase or decrease our level of collaboration on a project. We develop work over video calls that happen prior to and throughout the design and production process. We keep important documents, notes, and images in Google Docs to keep each other informed, and we use social media to post work in progress. For the past eight years, our collaborative process has used the tools necessary for working together in different locations. In 2016, Sarah Bryant moved to Alabama from the UK, and at that time, Trisha was living in North Carolina and Denise was living in Florida. This placed four of us in the southeast of the US. 
Though the five of us were still not able to meet often, our new proximity gave us a bit of gravity. Some combination of at least three of us were able to meet two or three times a year. Short, intensive work sessions with just two or three people became extremely helpful in moving projects forward. While at Florida State University in Tallahassee in May 2017, Denise, Sarah, and I decided to find the reference section of the library in order to identify a common text that we might all be able to use for a new collaborative project. We asked a library student worker for directions to the reference section, and they didn't understand what we were looking for. Eventually, we found it. The reference area at FSU is a vast holding in the lower level of the main library. As we walked around the reference area, we were taken in by the density of information, the various storage mechanisms and systems, and the colors associated with these materials. Although the reference section occupied a huge physical space, it was unoccupied. Clearly, methods of investigating information had changed. Shift Lab's search for a common text evolved into an interest in working with the reference section itself for the next project. Reference sources evolved over hundreds of years to answer specific types of questions that have emerged over time as we've sought to engage with information. Atlases, chronologies, encyclopedias, and other related reference types each satisfied a particular method of seeking information. We have moved away from the use of these resources and now rely on keyword search engines. As a result, we are able to access information with great speed, but are losing the aspect of the physical act of cross-referencing that enabled us to seek nuanced answers to carefully posed questions. Because Sarah is now situated as a faculty member within the library school, she was able to harass her colleagues for information on the history of reference and the complex context for its transformation. Satisfied that we had found something we were all interested in working with, we decided to create our own reference section as an artist book. Four of us met in May of 2018 in Huntsville, Alabama, and we worked together to produce mock-ups inspired by traditional reference types. As an organizing principle for the project, we selected a set of dates related to the shift away from the use of physical reference texts towards our reliance on algorithmic relevance. The first date was 1963, with the publication of Automation and the Library of Congress, also known as the King Report. The second date was 1991, the High Performance Computing Act, also known as the Gore Bill, and the advent of the World Wide Web. 1993 was the publication of Planning Second Generation Automated, Automated Library Systems and the release of Mosaic, the first web browser, which popularized the World Wide Web. And then the last date was 2001, the release of Wikipedia. We titled the project REF, and over the course of the next year, we worked collaboratively to refine and addition our representations of reference materials. The printing methods we used were screen print, letterpress, risograph, laser printing, and linoleum cut. REF includes 15 components, each inspired by a traditional reference type, housed together in a custom fit, uh, flip top box. Uh, the project was printed and bound in an edition of 40. The components include almanac, atlas, bibliography, biographical dictionary, chronology, concordance, dictionary, encyclopedia, gazetteer, guidebook, handbook, index, manual, and yearbook. References to the dates 1963, 1991, 1993, and 2001 and corresponding events can be found in each component, along other themes related to mapping, information, and documentation. I'm going to really quickly go through each of these 15 components um, for REF, and I'll highlight a, a few in a little bit of detail just to give you a sense. But this is um, our King letter. It's a facsimile of a letter which accompanied the 1963 King Report. This is our almanac. 
This is our atlas and, whoops, sorry, <laughs> multitasking. This is our atlas and gazetteer. A bibliography is a compilation of sources of information. In our bibliography, a list of sources for REF is interspersed with images of our mothers. This is our biographical dictionary. This is our chronology. This is our concordance. An encyclopedia covers knowledge in a comprehensive but summary fashion. It's a set of books intended to be read in sections, but ra rarely from beginning to end. Here, selections scanned from the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1771 were layered and etched into a laser, a laser cut plexiglass plate. The plate was printed and scanned again. The resulting image was enlarged and digitally printed onto a yard of fabric. It folds down to an eight by 10 mylar envelope. A dictionary is a resource that lists words in alphabetical order and gives their meaning. Our dictionary lists words that were entered into Merriam-Webster's dictionary in 1963, 1991, 1993, and 2001. A selection of these words were used in sentences. This book is a reflection of the way language is influenced by society at a particular time and place. This is our directory. A guidebook includes information about a place and is designed to be used by visitors. Our guidebook color use, is used to lead a person through the stacks to locate a particular journal. It contains samples of buckram that correspond to various titles from the discarded buckram journals from the University of Alabama Huntsville Library. This is our handbook, our index, our manual. And last, a yearbook is an annual publication reflecting on the events of the previous year. The 1990 Eugenian was the first yearbook reproduced on a CD-ROM. Our yearbook is a reproduction of that CD-ROM. Even as we worked on this project, our libraries were shifting beneath our feet. These two reference areas, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa on the left and the University of Alabama Huntsville on the right, underwent vast changes over the course of REF's production. The reference sections were literally disappearing from under our fingers while we sought to interpret them. When REF was completed, we participated in the Codex Book Fair, which take takes place biennially at the Craneway Pavilion in Richmond, California. There are over 220 tables with 450 book artists and vendors representing 30 countries from all over the world. Librarians from special collections around the US attend the fair to make purchases for their book arts collections. They're able to handle the artist's book and speak to us directly about the work. Over the years, we've built relationships with those who attend the artist book fairs. This is one of the most successful ways that we've placed our work in collections such as Yale, RISD, and Columbia University. Shift Lab also has representation from Vicki Stewart, who shows our work around the US to librarians who make purchases for their special collections. Through Vicki, we've, we've sold work to University of Iowa, University of Central Florida, University of Utah, amongst others. With the REF project complete and the, codex, the next Codex Book Fair rescheduled or scheduled for 2021, the members of Shift Lab gathered in Petaluma, California at Macy Chadwick's studio, and we were brainstorming for a new project. In the early stages of this project, we became interested in multiple discovery. The hypothesis that many scientists, scientific discoveries and inventions are made independently and more or less simultaneously by multiple scientists and inventors. We were thinking about this as a metaphor for a collaborative practice at a distance and envisioned performative finding events for the project. We created a series of mock-ups and arrived at, a stru at structural parameters for the project. In particular, a staggered foredge, 
limited color palette, a common horizon line, and found text from books that related to transitions in technology. The subject matter for the imagery was wide open for each artist to determine. We started with common parameters to observe how our results might converge or diverge. We titled the new artist book project Multiple Discovery. We selected uh, the colors black, sunflower, plum, and federal blue, allowing for a range of opacity, mixing colors, could only be achieved by layering colors on top of each other, not by mixing the inks together before printing. Within the set of limitations, each of us would work separately to create a series of printed folios for our individual discoveries. We plan to have five life binding events in various locations around the US, ending with a final event to bind the edition as a unified sequential narrative at the 2021 Codex Book Fair. We had a solid plan for multiple discoveries then in March 2020 due to the pandemic everything came to a halt and when I think back to the beginning of the pandemic it was hard to predict how long um, when it became clear that travel and gatherings were not going to happen anytime soon we began to think about how to adapt the project what specifically did we have to adapt to no face-to-face -face development no face-to-face -face production, no face-to-face -face marketing, no conferences or book fairs, no handling copies to woo clients. Our, market, our marketing needed to adapt. Vicki Stewart, who represents many book artists, could no longer travel to visit special collection libraries in person. Instead, she began meeting with libraries via Zoom. Shift Lab followed suit by creating handling videos for our artist books. Artist books are tactile objects. Handling an artist book is absolutely the best way for a client to connect with it. But we found that our videos were able to capture the feeling of handling much better than still images. When Printed, Matter, uh, Printed Matters New York Book Fair went virtual in February 2021, Shift Lab was able to include the video of Ref at her virtual table. Although different experiences, this was a different experience from a tra traditional book fair, the work was viewed by a large audience and sales were made. It meant a lot more video calls. With Zoom's explosion, we found that our video meetings would not suffer. We thought, we, fi we figured that our video meetings would not uh, suffer, but in reality, we just had such a difficult time scheduling um, Shift Lab calls around five different schedules of online teaching across three time zones. So instead, we relied heavily on the simple uh, networking tools that had really served us well. So Google Docs was invaluable for developing consensus and recording the progress of the project. And then text messaging was really instant and easy communication. With no face-to-face -face development or production means, we'd have to rely more on our studio, our individual studio practice. The global pandemic created an opportunity for Shift Lab to reimagine our project. Clearly, the live binding events were not going to happen. All five of us were having to deal with major adjustments to our livelihoods, teaching, and family. The Codex Book Fair had been on hold and was ultimately rescheduled for February 2022. This new deadline gave us some time to take a breath and adapt our new, to our new circumstances and to consider how we might modify the project. Fortunately, our original idea of working alone in our separate studios to develop the imagery for this artist book fit perfectly in the circumstances of this new world. Our studios, in our studios, we're printing our folios and text with a new deadline of June 1st, 2021. The text and folios for the edition of 50 will be exchanged throughout the through the post. We will choose a weekend in the summer of 2021 for us to work at the same time in our separate studios to each uniquely collate and bind editions of 10. This will result in five variations within the limited edition. Through this collation and binding process, we explore complex systems where individual decisions regarding sequence are unpredictable to the group, yet at the end, result um, consists of variations with, within highly organized editions. Uh, because I was leaving for Taiwan, I printed my folios and mailed them to Sarah before I left Alabama in January. 
Uh, my imagery is based on the book A River of Shadows by Rebecca Solnit. And I'm going to go through my images, my prints for this project, um, and I'll um, share the text that inspired each print. So the text that inspired this print is um, an impossible site, a transformation of a circular space into a linear image. This one is based on stillness imposed on its subjects, the world represented as a place of objects. An action condensed into a horizon. Just as viewers see in several directions at once, so they look at several separate moments. The slow motion of parades passing and things rising. And for this last one, they are told to keep time that is no longer solar. As I mentioned, Codex has been rescheduled for February 2022, and we're aiming to exhibit this project at the Artist Book Fair. It's hard for me to imagine that we'll be gathering again in the Craneway Pavilion, but I do feel hopeful. After working together for eight years, we've become increasingly interested in how work sustained over a long period of time takes shape. Our collaboration is an evolution, a living and changing entity. Our process adjusts as we individually adjust to new challenges in our lives and studios. This has also been the case with the pandemic, a new challenge to adapt to. Things within the group don't always go smoothly or on time or as expected, but they do move forward. When we think about the future and how we want to move ahead, we're most interested in that long game, the connecting tissue between our activity that binds all of our work together. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share this work. Looks like everyone's getting a, a couple of comments and questions to, to look at. And we're not, again, we're not limited to this, but it can just be a, a start and then we can, uh, open it up. Um, anybody see something they would like to start with there? I have a couple of questions. The first one is what the revenue model of the Chongqing Art Festival, I think it refers to where the money comes from, right? Actually, I was very curious, so I asked curators. It was basically like a self-funded private uh, uh, funding together with university uh, projects, you know? University each, uh, 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 did I mention that actually this project got collaboration with like different colleges and the departments from eight universities? So each department they brought with their like you know, classroom funding or project funding. So that's how they they got uh, funding. I, I was actually asking whether the government sponsored that. They said not yet, but they are trying to convince the government to maybe set up a funding for this project. That's what they want to do. Yeah. And the second question was the difference between the uh, art festival uh, I presented and the Echigo uh, Shumari Art Festival in Japan. Uh, that's a very well-known uh, art festival, land art festival in Japan. It's been going on like for starting to 2000, right? Uh, in terms of difference, I think uh, mm, this is a city wide and uh, it actually the beginning. And uh, in Japan, that's been going on for a long time. It involves like international artists, right? So I think in terms of influence, in terms of scale, in terms of experience, it's very different. And this one is really emphasized on uh, growing, like uh, uh, recycling waste, and then really promotes the idea of uh, co-independency. Co Right? Co-independency of different uh, systems the human society invented, like art, uh, education, science, economics, and uh, whatever. That we thought that they are separate, but they actually tried to uh, introduce an idea that actually they are interrelated through uh, no growing the basic, uh, the, the basic uh, human, uh, human activity that has not been taken away from most urbanites. But they actually tried to introduce the idea. 
So growing uh, is like a very important part of uh, uh, the Chongqing uh, Echo Art Festival. I think that maybe is a different uh, major difference. Although I am not an expert in uh, the Japanese uh, art festival, maybe who uh, had done research on that will know more. But I admire the uh, festival tremendously. Actually, it's uh, an inspiration for many socially engaged art projects in China. But I don't know about this particular one because I talked with the curators and they did not mention this particular one. But there are other projects that actually took inspiration from this Japanese art festival. I have more questions, but I would like to like uh, no, let our uh, colleague to, yeah, to answer their questions first. Great, uh, thank you. So I'll answer uh, two questions and then we'll pass the mic. Um, so one question was about how to, um, as their number of performances are continuing and new Apple TV is streamed Dolby, multi-audio to home theater, uh, so the new performing artists are facing the cold camera, so you're in a place performing to a camera instead of an audience. So do you have any way to bring excitement of live theater experience to performers? And I think that it's really, um, so I'm teaching currently at Grinnell College online, so I've been teaching acting and directing remotely. And so the students are in their homes, sometimes with their parents, and creating theater. And I think that um, a part of it is uh, within that community, how do you create community even though distanced? And so I think that be providing opportunities for, for dialogue and exchange, so it's not just we stage a pre-recorded show out into the public, but how do you provide then uh, spaces for talkback? So I think that providing the same sort of way that after performance you have the community engagement. So I think incorporating talkbacks and discussions into the performance schedule so it's not just the screening of the work is important. And then also I think the liveness. So it's actually uh, my students were staging their final yesterday for class and some were pre-recorded and one was live. And the pre-recorded work obviously the technical quality and the editing and sound and what they could play with was a lot more um, sophisticated but it was pre-recorded. It lacked sort of the, the sense of danger and excitement and this is happening now for you in the present moment. And so I really think that, so last year, and I, I sort of ran out of time so I didn't include it in my talk, but we did the show called Infinity where it was a live stream performance but it was really exploring the possibility of theater magic. And so we would have like, you know, the camera could be in a room and it would sort of shift down and we're using uh, Wirecast, which is a streaming that they use for athletics. So you're able to sort of cut immediately between the cameras. So the camera would move down as if it was sort of passing through the table and suddenly would cut to the, moving down in a basement and then pan to the left. And so suddenly you're using cinematic techniques to cut between the scenes. So that integration between live performance and pre-recorded work. You could also play with scales. So we had models, um, green screen work and sort of mask and manipulation. So really embracing the live performance but how do you maintain the magic of happening in the present as you're seeing it online? And really quickly, the other question was about monetizing. How do you monetize online performance, which a lot of uh, sort of panels we've been, I've been on discussing is sort of like, it's a huge question. Like, so how much money would you be willing to spend to watch a performance online? And the reality is probably not much, <laughs> right? Uh, because it's a it's sort of very limited experience. And so I think that as uh, producers or theaters are really sort of thinking about other models, I think we really have to look at like YouTubers, like why are they successful? Or look at different ways that people are using the medium of online performance and are marketing it. And so I think the average theater show is probably like a one-off event that happens once every four or five months for a theater company. That's sort of like the normal sort of process. So how do you maybe ch uh, create shorter works um, works that are sort of more addressed with the times as opposed to I'm now going to do uh, Oedipus Rex, right? Okay, maybe it's an interesting play, but but what's something that's responding immediately? And, and I think that sort of being that nimble sort of uh, at acting and reacting is going to be more and more important because these masterworks are great, but then there's a lull of four or five months between productions. And I think that to maintain or establish that relationship and to market it and monetize it, I think there's going to be a new, need to be a new relationship between the artist and the audience. Yes, any questions from the audience now? We can, we can open up. We have microphones floating around. Hi, um, I'm actually also a graphic designer and I loved uh, hearing your work and it also made me very, very much miss the art book fairs <laughs> and wanting to go back. I thought it was really interesting when you said that um, even though you and your team had been so used to working collaboratively on 
uh, over video chat or from a distance, even at the time of the pandemic, that uh, you still felt a little exhausted at the process of it and tra had to transition to a new uh, new piece. So, do you? But after doing uh, long long distance collaboration for so long, do you have any specific uh, like tips for any of us who are collaborating with people overseas? Do you have anything that you wanted to uh, like? practically share because I would love some if you have it. Yeah, I can say I, I also collaborate with another group called Wood Paper Vox and it's international and um, it's much more casual, it's sort of a different, different thing. Um, the advice I would say is that um, you have to find people that you totally trust, which I know we say a lot in collaboration, but it's true. And um, you have to find some way that you're going to stay connected in communication. And it doesn't really matter what it is. I think that it also, like in our group, has changed over time, um, particularly life events. Parenting has been a, a big obstacle and uh, jobs, teaching and moving. Um, so I think that finding a consistent way of communicating that works for the group and then being flexible about changing it um, and then the third thing is, I would say, to make sure that it's fun. Um, because when it's not fun, it, I mean, we all are working anyways, and it just the ability to have a, a, a friendship around it has actually been extremely valuable to me, especially as I felt more isolated. I mean, partially because of the pandemic, but also, you know, living in a place where I'm, I still uh, am somewhat new, um, those kinds of things. So, yeah, those would be my three things that I would advise. Thank you. Dr. Mazzaro? Allie, it's fine. Hi. Um, this is going to sound self-serving, but I don't mean it. It's my birthday today. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, but the reason I say it is because I couldn't think, when I got the invitation for this, I couldn't think of a better birthday present because I love the arts. I'm not an artist, but I love the arts. So first of all, thank you all and to Fulbright for doing this. And I guess my question is, as a person who loves the arts, but not in the arts, and all of you are in the arts, and also Professor Wong, if you could maybe, as a newcomer to Taiwan, introduce us to a couple of things that maybe you say, we have to go see or explore while we're here. And of course, all of your, you know, especially the projects, but other things that we could do. OK. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first, happy birthday. <laughs> and uh, really, that's amazing that you consider this is a great opportunity to celebrate. And that that's, that will make me very uh, touched. Uh, in terms of where to go, I have I got out right uh, February 23rd. That's why I officially got out from my quarantine. And I uh, visited a number of places in Taipei. And then I, was, uh, I went to Tainan. And actually, with my host, uh, with you, she's been so uh, supportive and generous with her time. So she takes me to many places. So I've been uh, visited uh, Jia Yi for the International Art Dog Film Festival, and uh, got to see, uh, yeah, Professor uh, 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 Craig, right? He gave an amazing talk. Of course, you missed it already, but his uh, he, his talk was so informative. I learned so much. And I also went to Hualien and got to see <laughs> their uh, private art space there. Yeah, and uh, where did I go? <laughs> I went to so many places. I basically made a tour of Taiwan already, uh, taking the train. It was so convenient and so much fun. So I think everywhere. I mean, the, amaz ama uh, the Jiayi Mun Municipal Art Museum is fascinating. The architecture, the design, and the exhibition is, is amazing. I think every city here they has a, their uh, municipal uh, art museum, and I think every every museum that I've been to, I really is impressed by the the architecture itself. Right, it is historical one, not developed no, during Japanese colonial period, or the recent very contemporary one. It one I really uh, I enjoy the space, and then I think the quality of the uh, the art shows there usually tend to be very selective. So I I like that. So maybe if you uh, if you had, if you have like no idea where to go, maybe just pick up a museum, a municipal art museum, and start from there. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, and from there you may not meet people, and then look at the artists, and then figure out okay other places you you can go from there. 
Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So I'll mention just a couple of spaces as well. So there's a Guling Jie Xiao Ju Chang. So it's an old police station which is converted into an experimental theater. It's probably about a 60 seat black box. And so a lot of young artists are working there. They also have talks. Um, again, there's like after show discussions and so great opportunity to meet artists. Uh, Kong Zong, which is an old Air Force base, which is on Zhong Xiao in near Zhong Xiao Xinsheng in that general area. And so it's an old Air Force base and they have a lot of contemporary artworks and um, some, some are interactive program, a lot of programming. A C Lab, which is like a um, contemporary sort of digital artwork. It's on the red line, I think by Jian Tan. Uh, so you can also check out that area. And then also the National Theater, which I talked a lot about. Right now they have so much programming. Uh, the National Experimental Theater, it's a 200 seat black box space. And so it's a really, it's an intimate environment to see a lot of internet, well, maybe not now, international now, but a lot of um, sort of groundbreaking work. And then the last um, uh, two places are the Taipei Fine Arts Museum by the Yuan Shan, Jie Yuan Zhan. And so they really have like an amazing contemporary art. It's 30 NT to get in, even if you just want to go get air conditioning, a great space to go. And then the Xichu Zhongxin, so traditional art space, which is by Zhishan uh, Metro Station. And so they have a lot of interesting um, uh, programming with just not traditional arts, but also thinking about how you contemporize that. And so thinking about collaborations between traditional artists and contemporary artists, and so exploring how to make traditional arts more accessible to the public today. And I think we should all sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Any other questions, comments? Yes, here in the front. Okay, uh, thank you for all of your presentations. And I just have a questions for all the speakers because uh, I think we have been talking about what the post pandemic world will be like. And there are a lot of new creative forms of art have been shaped because of this pandemic. And obviously a lot of things we have been conceived them as irreversible but uh, from all of your perspective do you think that when we reach to that level of the new normal would people really want to preserve this kind of new techniques for instance like the live streaming the pre-recording or do you think people would just directly go back to the pre-pandemic level we just forget what we have de developed and we together at the theater again without looking at any live streaming, any pre-recording materials at all and forget everything about that. So what do you uh, think about this? Thank you very much. Just real quickly for myself, um, I think there's a real longing to like have things be sort of the same again, <laughs> um, you know, especially with holding books, looking at art in real life, all these things. But I will say the experience has really had forced me and many people that I know to sort of gain new skills. And you know, whenever you learn something new, whether it's figuring out how to do a video recording of your book or make a demo, do a demo live. I mean, I've just suddenly done so many demos live. I had never done that before. It's kind of hard to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you want, you know, it just becomes another tool in your toolbox. And, and I think it's really unknown how it will influence things, but I think it will be there. Uh, from my perspective, I think it's impossible for humanity to go back as it was before. Uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of advantages that, that we uh, are able to explore because of the pandemic, right? And like the new skills and the new kind of connections. Like personally, I've been able to really benefit from so many uh, talks that are available online, recording the major museums, major institutions became so generous all of a sudden, right? Open online uh, Zoom web, uh, webinar and recording on YouTube so you just can uh, follow uh, watch and listen while in the past you had to be there and all you had to pay but now no so that that I hope they'll continue right but maybe some will not but uh, uh, I'm thinking about more uh, critical side is uh, the norm there's many problems with the what we consider the norm in the past 
for one thing, in the art world, there's this meta museum building where they hold this, held this uh, broadcast, how do, how do you say, broadcaster or expensive pioneers exhibition where people travel around the world to see the shows. This is so unsustainable, right? And but it became like the norm. But maybe this is an opportunity that we reflect and see those things uh, of the art world that create a lot of problems. Then they not, uh, it's no longer tenable. And we have to give, maybe we have to give up that. And I think maybe more and more people recognize that. So that I think will be something that is not going to be the norm, right? We are going, we, I think we, we are going to abandon that. So. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I, um, I think that, that once you've started working with, now you're dealing online, and so you're really approaching, if you're a theater actor, and suddenly you're dealing with the camera, you're dealing with sound editing, you're dealing with a whole new set of questions and techniques and aesthetics, and that'll inform your work. I think already artists were really doing work with live performance and integration of projections and other mediums, and I just think that that's going to increase. Also, I think that you know, with uh, looking at the National Theater with their 5G, sort of setting up that technology. So, I mean, the National Theater has known that uh, London has been doing that since 2009. I think there's this motivation to set up this, I mean, and not just buying the equipment, you also need to have a production team that's gonna be recording and disseminating the work. And I think it's really gonna strengthen Taiwan's place on the international arts market. Um, I think that's gonna sort of create where before we're used to seeing a show staged in London around the world, uh, why not Taiwan? And so I think it's providing uh, new models and um, opportunities, as well as um, I think with the uh, uh, Biennale is also with international um, sort of artists and residencies. Before it was like, if you're gonna be an artist in residence, you have to travel there. And I think some of the programs are now shifting that model to think about online collaborations, where I'm still here and you're in Singapore, or you're in Tokyo or in New York, and how can we collaborate? What type of work can we generate? And so I think that that type of online collaboration, it, it's already creating relationships which we probably wouldn't have established before and readily accessible. I don't need to jump on a plane. I don't need airfare. I don't need funding. We can do this. And I think that it's changing the way that artists are collaborating. And last thing I'm going to mention is I think there's been a huge shift in Taiwan towards uh, virtual reality. Um, so there's the Taipei uh, Artists, T-A-I-C-C-A, the Taiwan Creative Content Agency. And so this huge government foundation, which is supporting VR, which becomes accessible. You can record the work, and then if you have an Oculus headset, you can watch it anywhere. And so actually, Huang Lao Shi, so uh, he's probably Taiwan's most uh, successful VR artist. So if you have questions about VR, talk to him after. I mean, it really is, um, his work is, uh, is amazing and sort of groundbreaking. And I think that after the success of his sort of work, it's really shifted the market towards um, you know, VR as a sort of combining performance and film and thinking about these other ways that we take acting for the stage and shift it to a different medium. It, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. If I may just uh, add uh, to what Greg was saying that we still want to learn, we want to collaborate, right? we want to learn from each other, we don't want to I to be isolated. So we still want the cosmopolitanism, right? That's like it's really valuable. Uh, uh, a, a accomplishment of modern society, but we probably want to reinterpret right, how to accomplish this uh, cosmopolitanism. We don't have to do it with physical contact, maybe. So. Um, I just want to share a thought uh, on, on this, is that uh, in the pandemic, you will see a lot of people using Zoom and try to perform at their home. And for me, I think that's a, a wonderful thing because uh, I think the art world used to be I think we gradually have evolved into this like, huge post-production. It's like we use technology too much and then almost technology cover the, uh, the, the intrinsic quality of the art. But at the pandemic, we will see that the people like uh, try to, especially I think uh, I see a lot of musicians like performing at their house and in their living rooms. And I think that bring that quality uh, and then I think again the people started thinking, oh, uh, the art doesn't need to be that polished. I think that's spontaneous. And I think if people start to live on that, I think it's kind of like a, in Tang Dynasty, the uh, Tang San Cai. It's like uh, they, uh, like they made this pottery, um, pottery, but they find out they, they cannot control the color, and they start to learn that they should love this color. And I think that's the kind of interesting uh, divergent maybe that will stay after the pandemic. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much for the really interesting and different perspectives. Um, um, I, was, I was very struck by the role of the government that, that Dr. Quintero was talking about in, in thinking ahead and creating these initiatives that actually will be maintained somehow by a government agency that has the funding and the backing and the history. And I was wondering um, for Dr. Wang's projects in Chongqing, and I've not been to mainland China, so I don't know, um, what is the role of the city or the government in doing this? Because in Taipei, for example, you see every neighborhood has parks. Every place gets developed, um, you know, the, 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 the riverside. It keeps being developed by the city itself. So once the, the neighborhoods create this or the artists or the college professors come and create a project like this, where does the city come in and take over or, or initiate these new things on its own? That's a good comment, a good question. I was also impressed by the, the parks that are so convenient, accessible to residents in, in, tai, in tai, Taiwan, right? And that's definitely not the case in uh, China as the Chinese urban transformation has been really large scale. I was impressed by the scale, the human scale that's so easily accessible in Taiwan. But in major cities in China, that has not been the case, as it's like, you know, the, the total scale, the, the scale is, it's no, it's how I, I don't know how to say it, but really it's the major city like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou has been developed with like a car mobility in mind rather than human mobility, not with your legs walking. So that's been the problem, it's been, uh, but being criticized. So in recent years, there's really effort to, as I, I, I mentioned briefly, right, the micro reconstructions being introduced by, uh, supported by the government to actually invest in uh, slight renewal to rather than tear down the entire uh, urban neighborhood, but to improve it in, in a more organic way. So the government has been doing that, and that's what actually a, a, a kind of policy support that the artists actually take advantage of. Right? Although government has not been uh, funding like uh, those grassroots projects like what I mentioned here, right? but policy support in mainland China is so important. Or let's say, non-interference from the government actually is the support. If the government doesn't interfere, that's great. Yeah? It, the, what the uh, independent the other communities worries about, government will interfere and shut down what they were doing. So no interference actually is good. Of course, they hope that eventually they would win over policy uh, decision makers and they'll get funding, but that's uh, like another story. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, the Fulbright program is a great supporter of the arts and I'm very proud that in addition to scholars and researchers and students and teachers uh, we here at Fulbright Taiwan also bring artists to Taiwan from the United States and in collaboration with Taiwan's Ministry of Culture we send five artists and arts professionals to the United States every year on Fulbright Awards. So I'm so pleased that we had this event and if I could just make one observation um, about what the three presentations had in common apart from the post-pandemic theme uh, and that is that uh, during the pandemic, the, pa the pandemic has, has been a significant challenge to people's mental health and has led to, uh, I think, more depression, uh, sense of isolation, and so on. Um, and, but I'm so struck by these presentations and the feeling of hope uh, and vision that, that I see here that are so inspiring um, and reimagining of old things, whether it be like old reference books and making them tactile and beautiful again in new reimagined ways or old neighborhoods uh, and ugly buildings that are converted into something that the community together is recreating or the classic you know body movement and speech that is at the heart of theater but now reimagined in these new ways so uh, a feeling of hope you know a feeling of, of brightness and vision is what I've gotten from today's presentations and I thank you so much for that and for the audience for signing up for the event. Dahlia, thank you again for organizing this and I hope everyone has a pleasant weekend. Thank you. <laughs>